entitled Global Hegemony Com Competition, the US versus the EU versus China versus Russia. We have five esteemed panelists, Joe Sirincioni in the blue shirt, is the president of Plowshares Fund and is an expert on nuclear weapons, currently teaching at the Georgetown uh, University School of Foreign Service. Before that, he was a member of the US House of Representatives Armed Services and Government Operations Committees, and he was also Damn. a member of the <laughs> International Security Advisory Board to Secretaries of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. Dr. Peter Light, at the extreme left side of this table, uh, is uh, In more ways than one. He's <laughs> 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 a sinologist with an exceptional sense of humor and, <laughs> and an extensive background in international banking and teaching. He is a board member of the Council of International Educational Exchange, the One Sky Foundation, and Prudential Financial. He earned his doctorate in Asian studies, in East Asian studies, excuse me, from Princeton. Maggie Salem, in hot pink, is the executive director of the Qatar Foundation International, an organization that promotes the study of the Arab language and culture in the Americas, Europe, and the Middle East. Salem has done substantial work with democracy and good governance promotion in North Africa and the Middle East and served as a special assistant to Secretaries of State, to Secretary of State Maddie Albright and U.S. Ambassador to Israel Martin Indyk. Her academic training is in Arab studies, political science, and psychology. Next to me in white, we have Mor <laughs> Morgan Key the CEO of Motif International, an expert on conflict mitigation and enhancing sustainability and stability. She has held positions at the State and Defense Departments, as well as USAID. Her academic training is in international policy, environmental biology, and religious studies. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Ross Wilson. Uh, who served as the U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan and then Turkey, and in addition to also having had embassy assignments in Moscow and Melbourne. He also served as the Deputy Executive Secretary for State Department Secretaries James Baker, Lawrence Eagleburger, and Christopher Warren. Currently, Ambassador Wilson is a distinguished senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a visiting lecturer in international affairs at George Washington University. We are all absolutely delighted and honored to have you here as guests. We will start in the order in which I introduced you with Joe going first. And each of you will take about five minutes for your initial remarks on the topic of the day. We'll then have a small discussion addressing each other's points. That sounds good. We will actually start in order of <laughs> in order with uh, uh, starting starting on my left uh, with uh, Morgan Key going first, uh, which is completely fine. After uh, <laughs> after five minutes of initial remarks, uh, we'll have a brief discussion addressing uh, the highlights of uh, every every uh, uh, speaker's uh, uh, arguments. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. At this point, I will start collecting questions in a written form. Uh, if any of you want to pass anything uh, uh, towards me, I, I, I believe that the producers will be collecting these questions and bringing them over. Uh, without further ado, I give you Morgan Key. Thank you. <laughs> Let's just 
saying to Ambassador Wilson, I think I'm the straw man or straw woman, as it were, so everyone can discredit all of my comments if I go first. Um, so um, I'm, I don't know why. Something about the air in Boulder just makes me feel a little bit controversial sometimes. So, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> um, so my alma mater, good to be back. Um, I, I feel like my, my life has taken a far cry from, uh, from Boulder when I was not at all thinking about the hegemony of uh, you know, global superpowers and, and sort of the, the, the new world order, as it were, when I was studying biology and religious studies here. Um, but I've since had the opportunity to serve in uh, the 3D agencies of our government, diplomacy, development, and defense, um, and, and really contemplate often this, this perennial question of you know, China, Russia, they're, they're coming to get us. You know? and, and in each of those agencies, this, this seems to be you know, the, the new fear that has gripped um, the foreign policy establishment. And I just came from the keynote talk in Mackey Hall, maybe some of you were there, and uh, the, the excellent speaker's last point was that fear actually paralyzes our cognitive ability, right? And, and so I find myself, um, while I don't dispute the, um, the, the very real threats to um, economic hegemony and to social norms in many ways that are posed by kind of this new great power competition between the US, China, Russia, as it were, um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm sort of disheartened to, to notice how infrequently people ask, so what? So what if mm. the hegemonic monopolar world order that has been dominated by the United States is challenged. I, I frankly find um, a, a friend of mine who's a fluent uh, Mandarin speaker, uh, he, he loves to point out that the, the, the Mandarin character for, and correct me if I'm wrong, we have a sinologist at the table, for crisis is the character for danger plus opportunity. So you know, while this crisis of you know, the US grip on hegemonic control, am I right? Okay. <laughs> Move on. Move on. All right. Okay. That's straw woman. Straw woman. Um, it's a good, it's a good story. He, 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 well, he is, a, he is a native Mandarin speaker, so I'm going to have to go back to him on, on this. But, um, you know, so I, while, I, while in the eyes of many people, if, if you're on um, sort of Team USA, uh, the, the threat of other superpowers does feel like a crisis, um, I, I really do believe that this this time, this moment that we live in when, when our hegemony is, is being uh, challenged is an opportunity. And, and particularly it's an opportunity to reflect on uh, some of the systems that we have gripped to so dearly. Um, you know, a, a certain flavor of capitalism, a certain flavor of consumerism, a flavor of democracy that um, are imperfect in many ways. And what I find sort of refreshing just about this topic, and I really eagerly anticipate um, the comments of the panel and questions from the audience, is what can we learn about our own norms and values when we're confronted with norms and values that are just radically different? And I think that um, what, I, what I find reassuring about the fact that there are true um, counterpoints to our own hegemony is, is that it, it just points out the fact that our way of doing things is not the inevitable that there are fundamentally way, different ways to approach problems, to approach the organization of, of human institutions. Um, and I think that the human society is better off when they reflect on different, different options and don't take one pathway as, as an inevitable. That said, um, I will absolutely say that as, as still part of you know, the, the foreign policy community uh, and a former diplomat um, and, and one now who works uh, very closely with the US military on trying to uh, prevent or deter uh, conflicts, particularly with superpowers, um, that these are very real threats um, and, uh, and unfortunately our, our ability to sort of understand the nature of these threats is still so vastly limited. Uh, we don't understand how economic and political levers of power are utilized by, by Russia, by, uh, by China, even by the EU. Whether those things are good or bad for, for us or for humanity are sort of secondary to the fact that we just simply don't understand them. So, um, so my, my comments, uh, hopefully just to sort of prod a bit, are, um, you know, yes, we live in a uh, potentially soon to be non-monopolar world, and so what? <laughs> Thank you for these remarks. Uh, next will be Ambassador uh, Wilson.
Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great uh, pleasure to be back at CWA. <coughs> this is uh, my second time here. We had such a terrific uh, time in uh, in 2018. We were my wife and I were just delighted to have the opportunity to come back here and be part of this very interesting conversation that's quite different from other international affairs conferences where you have a lot of talking heads kind of saying the same things about the same narrow range of subjects. There's a huge diversity here, and my hats go off to the, uh, to the organizers for what they do. Um, in, uh, in thinking about this, uh, this topic, I, I, I did one thing uh, at the outset. I Googled global hegemony competition hmm. to see what would come up exactly. Um, one of the leading pieces you find that, that I came across, America Losing Global Influence, Atlantic Monthly in uh, August 2018, or an item uh, published by The Hill, Is China's Hegemony a Foregone Conclusion? And, and sort of sc scrolling down through a couple of pages of this, what I came away with was um, that, that the, the various things that popped up when you Google global uh, global hegemony competition, it, it's, it's, um, it's actually not global. It's the United States declining relative to others, and it's, and it's this threat of China that Morgan referred to. Russia, mm, I went through like five or ten pages, and it, it never was there much in there about Russia being a threat of, uh, or posing a threat of global hegemony that would affect us or anybody else, and of course the European Union even much less. Um, the, uh, but if you take one of those words out, the hegemony word, global competition, this sort of picks up on what Morgan was talking about, we clearly live in a much more competitive world than, <clears throat> at least in retrospect as we look back on the 1990s, uh, 2000s, a much more US dominated world than, than exists today. It is a much more competitive world. It is one where the European Union, for its weaknesses in military, its weaknesses internally in other spheres, is absolutely an economic competitor of the United States. And economic competition uh, today kind of matters. Certainly it matters to the government in Washington. Um, Russia, uh, absolutely a competitor, not in the sense of duking it out with the United States in the way that the Soviet Union did, for, uh, for, uh, for influence, for dominance in, in the third world, in Europe, uh, elsewhere, um, but, but absolutely strongly competitive with us. You see it in Russia's uh, military developments. Uh, you see it in Russia's deployment in Syria, uh, Russia's engagement with Iran, uh, Russia's engagement with a wide, with a wide range of other players. Um, it is in the game co competing with us in very deliberate ways. Um, and, then, and, then, and then there's China, which is competing in all of those ways very successfully with the United States. The, um, uh, although I think, and I think other speakers will, will talk about this a little, bit more, uh, a little bit more clearly than I can, I'm not a China expert, China absolutely competing with the United States in, in the economic realm, in the military realm, uh, in other areas, but it isn't a global power does not in any way, shape, or form rival the United States as a global power. It, it isn't intervening elsewhere in the world, outside of the, the region right around it at least. If you think of the South China Sea, uh, certainly people who, uh, non-Chinese look at that as Chinese intervention outside of China, but that's not the way they see it. They're, they've not, the Chinese have not engaged in regime change. They are not providers of security to other countries around the world. Um, they, uh, they pose no immediate or, or operational threat to American security. Uh, they don't seek, as the Soviets did, to export their system. And their system arguably doesn't look all that attractive to most others who deal with it. Um, so it, it, it's a competitor. It, uh, it, seeks to, uh, it seeks to find ways to reassert what was China's role in international politics before, I don't know, 18-something, another, uh, as one of the leading powers in the world, as one of the leading powers in East Asia. And where that competition in a military sense comes really to, to the fore is in East Asia, where the US-dominated order uh, is, is uh, under a lot of question. 
but I think for American policymakers, it poses a lot of questions as well for them. The last point I'll make, and it follows up on what Morgan said, it absolutely makes a difference to the United States that this is, this is happening. Our ability to, uh, to shape the international environment in ways to protect American security and American economic interests are absolutely affected when there are stronger, more credible, more serious competitors like Russia and China, and to some extent the European Union. Leave it at that. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Maggie Salem is next. So, um, for obvious reasons, one of the countries that's been left off the list of global hegemonic players is Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> what? Discrimination. Oh. <laughs> so, my point being, though, you know, your perspective on this issue depends on whether you sit in Washington, Brussels, Doha, Beijing, um, and perspective is very powerful, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what I assume. I don't come with actual talking points. Um, it is like to be sitting in Doha watching this evolving landscape. Small, small countries, whether you're Denmark or Qatar, have a very different perspective on what goes on between large powers. They're often caught in the vice grip, they're often casualties of some bigger and broader conflict. Um, and I think they are often buffeted by these winds, sometimes forming coalitions. There's a group you would not know about called the, um, the Dry Lands Alliance. I know, doesn't that sound wonderful? Anyway, you might at certain <laughs> times of year think you should join it. Um, but this is basically a UN, a UN coalition of countries, many of them very small, or islands, that are trying to band together in order to be able to have a powerful block and raise their issues before some of the larger powers. So there's a lot of this large, small power relationship and power play at work. And it's interesting to watch a small country uh, and I've spent 10 years working at the foundation that I, I work for uh, during two very different admi US administrations and watching a small power try to figure out how to navigate changing tides of Washington, much less what's happening in Beijing, Russia, the European Union, now Brexit. And I don't know that I have any profound insights, except that you have to be a very capable and very determined leader to navigate all of those, because it's about weapon sales, it's about purchasing, um, it's other forms of economic power, and Qatar obviously has money, and so it uses its money as its one major weapon, and obviously it also has a big resource, natural gas. It also has, a geopolitical place, and it took that place after the Saudis asked us to leave our military base, take our military base with us in 2002, and that base moved to Qatar, so it has some military power, um, not of its own, and the base is not there to defend Qatar, so if the Saudis come across the border, technically the U.S. would do nothing, because it's not part <coughs> of a bilateral defense relationship. But it uses these tools in order to build a relationship with a very powerful, still, hegemonic player, the US. It uses other tools, buying other weapon systems, making investments, philanthropic gifts to countries like China and Russia and others in order to try to balance out that relationship with the US. So it's really interesting to you know, step aside for a moment from us, we're all Americans, or most of us are Americans, um, and look at it from a different perspective and from a very small place that's currently blockaded by its neighbors, a blockade that was supported in part by Washington at the beginning, and now not so much. So there's that, because we're very clear all the time. <laughs> and I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. It's, I, I love coming to Boulder. I can't remember what conference this is for me. 
13th, 14th. But I remember being in this room with Rachel Maddow uh, when, when she was still doing her radio show and, and having maybe some of you were here. And, and I, love because, I love coming here in part because it lets me uh, think about and then talk about these very, very big issues like global hegemony. The United States is the most powerful country the world has ever known. The Roman Empire was nothing compared to what we have. We, we dominate the world militarily, economically, diplomatically, politically, and culturally. Kids in rural Chinese villages dance to hip hop beats that come out of inner city America. You know, there's, there's, there's nobody like us. And, and for most of my life, that was a great thing. That was a great thing, in part because we were locked in a struggle for global hegemony with the Soviet Union and that military alliance, that political alliance, that diplomatic alliance that, that they had. And then suddenly it was over. It was gone. And I remember being on the House Armed Services Committee, we were wrestling with this. What does this mean? The generals would come up to the House Armed Services Committee and they always would start off with a threat assessment that would then justify the force structures and the weapons and therefore the budgets they needed. And suddenly there was a big question mark on what the threat assessment was. And it went on for years until I remember the Air Force coming up and had this ch the charts they always bring in the, the threat assessment was the threat was uncertainty. <laughs> and I thought, that is freaking brilliant. <laughs> And now we don't have a threat-based defense budget. You know, we have a cap what they call a capabilities-based. We build what we can, what we want, for the mass of unknowns that, that are out there. And we now have a, a view that we should dominate the planet, that this is a good thing. And I'm telling you, uh, the US global hegemony is unsustainable and unnecessary. And here's what I mean. Thank you. And here's what's unnecessary. First, you have to get over this. There's, a, there's one of my friends, Robert Kagan, who is a neoconservative and argued strenuously for the US invasion of Iraq and then justified it afterwards by talking about the need for a benign hegemony, that somebody has to rule the world. So it, it, let, let it be the United States. Who would you rather dominate the world? China? France? Yeah. Germany? You know, who would you, and, and we have a benign hegemony where we basically, and I think this is basically true, we advance our democratic uh, liberal values, we support international systems, we support a free market economy, et cetera, until we started to screw it up. <laughs> and now we are, we are screwing this up badly. We are screwing this up badly, and I don't mean just the Trump presidency. I'm, I mean the, the sort of sickness that, is, that has taken over our, our country, where we, we fear everyone, we fear everything, and we've distorted what it means to be leadership to mean just the military dimension. I'm gonna just to take this, this small point. This week, the Secretary General of NATO, Stoltenberg, came and gave an unprecedented address to the two houses of Congress. And he had 15 standing ovations. And one of them was when he said that President Trump was right to demand that the NATO allies spend more and that everybody was committed to spending 2% of their gross domestic product and we were gonna spend more in the military. And everybody stood up and cheered. And this is the idea that we need more and more and more. But defense against what? We've lost all perspective on this, on this military. And this is why it's unsustainable. The, the globe spends $1.7 trillion every year on, on military forces and weapons. All the countries, $1.7 trillion. The United States and our NATO allies spend $1 trillion of that. So 60% of all military spending is spending on us. The NATO allies alone account for about $260 billion in, in defense spending, 260. So what are they defending against? Well, Russia is the, name, is the major threat. Russia only spends about 66 billion. Their last budget was cut. They're spending less on military now. So NATO outspends out them all by itself. The NATO European countries spe outspend Russia four to one, and yet we, the United States, Trump, the Democrats, the Republicans, insist that we spend more. And this grossly distorts the idea of what it means to have national security, what it means to have global security, when it comes to just this, this, uh, this military dimension. And we're leading the pack on this. And so, when, 
when Morgan says we should welcome a decrease in U.S. influence, I agree with that. We should not be afraid of a shared power structure. That's why we started the United Nations. That was the whole idea. That's why one of the most popular science fiction franchises in history is based on a federation of planets. <laughs> The whole idea is to have shared responsibility, shared unity. And I'm telling you, if, if the United States continues in the policies that it's going, nobody's going to want us to run their systems. Nobody's going to want us. The only way that we can possibly be a major partner in this shared power structure of the future, which I think is coming, is that if we clean up our act and start standing for our values and our roots and get, and get away from the kinds of distortions that were introduced in the American system with the invasion of Iraq. Thank you, Joe, for these spirited remarks. Uh, Peter is next. First of all, I am never complacent about being invited here. It's a tremendous pleasure to be at CWA again, and I thank you. I mean that. I, I hate to sound like a Brooklyn hipster, but I would like to suggest that the question being discussed today is very 20th century. There is an outlier in this uh, group of names, and that is China, and I will explain that. Right now, there is no Cold War. There's no balance of power. We are now, I reckon, in a hot war with no guns. It's a war of mayhem being waged using technology. And I think the story, for me at least, begins with Brexit enter the weaponization of social media orchestrated by bad actors who conflated delusions of an England that never existed and was a dog whistle to racism, greed, and ignorance. And if the dark powers prevail in England, England of all places will be casting its lot with Hungary, Poland, and Italy, weakening the EU profoundly. Brexit was the dog whistle in itself to the American body politic. I think I'd like to talk about the US now. I don't want to talk about collusion. I don't want to talk about conspiracy. But the same bad actors, the Russians, involved themselves in our election of 2016. And that is simply undisputed. The current administration has withdrawn from TPP, attacks NAFTA, demonizes Canada, assaults NATO, defends the Saudis, Erdogan, and Kim Jong-un, and started a trade war with China over televisions, and not the theft of intellectual property, which is a serious issue. The unraveling of the EU in America has been abetted by the Russians and has brought about the fortunate alienation of China. China now is standing alone, um, and I think China standing alone in the world is doing a jig. The irony is that English jingoism and making America great again has led to the ascent of Russian mischief and the meaningful rise of China. Why wouldn't China uh, be making its way in the world if it's given to them and we're standing aside? China has strategy, which none of the other players have. I'd like to remind you of a very funny remark made by Zhou Enlai. Henry, Henry Kissinger asked him what he thought of the French Revolution, and he said it was too soon to tell. <laughs> China's rise, I would maintain, is far less fearsome than our own knowing withdrawal from the world. But there is one sign of hope. America remains aspirational. I don't know for how long. Nobody wants a Chinese passport. But there is one flashpoint with China, only one, and that is Taiwan. Thank you. So uh, for the next stage of uh, this panel, uh, I will uh, let the panelists address each other uh, if they have any uh, remarks for each other. If, uh, if not, I will start off with a question and then we'll take the questions uh, from the audience, of which I have already taken some. I, Does anybody want to? I'd like to, to ask a question about um, the Arab-speaking world. And it's, 
in the, holistically, if one can even see beyond its own rivalries and deep-seated um, um, whatever. Um, are, they, are they sitting in the bleachers? Where are they? Uh, well, right now, one of them is trying to take over Libya. Um, meanwhile, um, if you've been watching the news, there's amazing protests, a new Arab Spring of sorts, in Sudan and Algeria, two countries that were not part of wave one. Um, and fascinating. And in Sudan, there is a woman, I'm forgetting her name, who has become the new icon of that revolution, of her dancing on top of a car, not an image you would normally think about. Um, there are factions within the Arab world. They are not asleep. They're not asleep at all in the same, what you're talking about as the EU, uh, the UK and the US having their own issues and devolving into, you know, who is a true Brit, who is a true European, who is a true American. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, you know, when the cats are away, the mice will play. And there are alliances forming. You saw this at the beginning of this administration um, between, actu between countries that are not natural allies, like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They actually have historic rivalries teaming up with Egypt um, and Bahrain, which doesn't really count. Bahrain is basically a part of Saudi Arabia against Qatar. I am not trying to speak on behalf of the Qataris, but that did happen. It is truth. Um, and they did that for a very deliberate reason, and it's about resources. Mm -hmm. There was a plan to attack, take over the country. Um, the Emiratis are right now supporting Haydar in his move on Tripoli, mm -hmm. which is going to kill thousands mm -hmm. of Libyans. Mm -hmm. And it's a UN-recognized government, and no one's stopping it. Mm -hmm. um, so in this world that we're moving into, and I think all of the panelists have outlined how different forces are at work and for different reasons and different interests, there are other parts of the world where, no, people aren't sleeping and waiting to hear on the news how it all worked out. They're mm -hmm. actively mm -hmm. pursuing, because all countries do this, it's crazy, their own interests. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Is that helpful? I mean, and, and the Saudis and the Israelis, I mean, top that. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Which Israelis? Uh, I just want to clarify, since I happen to have lived there, and we have Bibi, and he's an Israeli, and then you might have others. Quite. Thank you. Okay, let me let me kick this off with uh, with a question. After which uh, I will take some. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll ask you some of the questions that came from the audience, as well as questions from the online app. Uh, since almost all of you touched upon this, the changing role of uh, global competitiveness. Uh, some of you called it, uh, it's a 20th century question. Uh, others uh, express confidence in the world order as it has been over the last few years to continue uh, for a very long time. But Winston Churchill once famously said, we have no lasting friends, no lasting enemies, only lasting interests. To what extent is this notion relevant to the United States today, as it's close to a 100-year-old alliance with Europe seems to come under more and more questions every day, and its pivot to Asia strategy necessitates a reevaluation of its relationship with both its current key challenger and regional superpower, China, and its old mortal enemy, but perhaps a possible useful counterweight to Chinese dominance in Asia, Russia. What alliance structure, if any, would be most appropriate for US interests in the 21st century? I would love to respond to that. Morgan. <laughs> so I. I I'm not one to often agree with Winston Churchill, but uh, <laughs> but I <laughs> yes, as bold as that may be, um, I'm a pretty fierce uh, anti-neocolonialist. <laughs> but um, I do believe absolutely that uh, there are no lasting or permanent friends, enemies, only interests. But where I take issue with that statement is that um, Winston Churchill, a statesman, was speaking from the view of a very Westphalian system, which was the us in that context was the state. 
And um, to the question, what might be a useful alliance structure, I would say one that is supra-state based. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that an alliance doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, one of in, an intergovernmental organization such as NATO or the OECD or the UN, frankly, but rather one of interests that align. Uh, interests of justice, interests of sustainability, interests of um, you know a, a world where competition is viewed as just uh, you know f fuel and motivation to innovate, and rather than to arm. Um, so to me, I, I find it um, very 20th century that we still find ourselves trapped in Westphalian state-centric views of the world rather than you know, it, recognizing the world that we already live in, which is composed of institutions that shape us more than, far more so than do our states that we are citizens of, right? We, we are part of economic systems as, as consumers as homeowners that where we have you know financial products that cross borders that know no borders we we buy products from the, you know we we exist with commodities in the material world in a very global way our products have value chains and supply chains that stretch across borders uh, we have friends we have family members that probably live across borders um, we you know we communicate over devices and networks that are not state based so to me the new alliance structure is one that is fundamentally uh, that that sort of confronts the reality that a state-based view of the world may not be the most useful anymore. Thank you, Morgan. Um, Maggie? Well, I was just going to um, applaud that thought because I think this is part of the identity politics and what is adding fuel to this is this idea that the structures that we know and understand or think we understand are actually not as relevant and the idea of cross-national everything is threatening. You know, your identity is based on, you say, what words do you say about yourself? How do you identify yourself? What do you use? Coloradan and American. And these words don't have the resonance. They don't have the power they once had. Or they cause confusion. And I think that if you start from understanding that, I would just say that, that that's a nice way of hooking into some of the other themes of the conference, which is looking at different political movements that are forming. Um, including the alt-right. Hmm. Ambassador? Um, I, I, I'll just add a couple of, uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, what, <clears throat> what has made America, there are a lot of things that have made America influential for the last 40 or 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. Uh, it's, but, but one of them has been the alliances that we've had, the relationships we've had. We Countries have wanted to partner with us, and they still want to partner with us. Yeah. Um, and the more partners we have, the better mm -hmm. in, in, in general. Uh, and I think, I think, not to disagree with anything that my, my colleagues have said, but I think that also needs to be at the center of what we, what we aim to do. Uh, and so I, I point to a couple of places where that's practically ap applicable. One is in the Americas. As we look at, an, at a more competitive international <clears throat> economic environment, the logic behind NAFTA in the first place when it was adopted 20 years ago, the logic behind free trade agreements that we have with Colombia, Peru, uh, Panama, uh, Dominican Republic, there are several Central American countries, the logic behind the free trade either area of the Americas, I was a negotiator for that uh, hemispheric free trade area, was to pull together this kind of giant economic hinterland that could help make America more competitive economically by, by, uh, by helping and working with our immediate neighbors. Uh, and, and I think the logic of that, the logic of paying attention to the Americas is still compelling to me. Paying attention to our NATO allies, mm -hmm. working with our NATO allies, working with them and working uh, as well with, with others in a somewhat more, in, an, in a less domineering way. We haven't exercised that kind of diplomacy in a situation that we didn't dominate since about 1943. That's a different style. It's a different way that you do these things. Bill Burns, who retired not long ago as mm -hmm. Deputy Secretary of State, writes, you know, we're, we're a little out of practice at, at diplomacy among mm -hmm. a lot of equal powers, and we need, we, that's a, a set of things we need to try to address. And then I think unquestionably we need to find ways to engage with China. Just as we did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, we got to talk to the Chinese, engage them where we can, 
in strengthening international stability, strengthening prosperity, strengthening order, and where we can't, uh, we compete, and we make damn sure we're competing successfully. Thank you, Ambassador. I uh, have a student question uh, for all of you. Uh, the role of non-state actors and organizations has been a destabilizing force for superpowers. How does this role affect the balance of world power? Did you say non-state? Non-state actors, that's right. Why not start with state actors? State <laughs> actor. I mean, I, I think the Russians are crawling all over us. That's a state. And just because um, they have a declining economy, uh, and an upset population, um, going nowhere, um, that doesn't make them uh, less of a threat. And I, I, it, what really strikes me, sorry about the non-state comment, but I don't even know why Russia is being discussed here today because they, are, they, they stand for very little in terms of influence in the world. Yeah. And they are punching above their weight at such a level that makes absolutely no sense. So now, now, sorry, never mind. <laughs> Non-state, I would say they have relatively little influence, except in in how they 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 trigger a state response that leads to great consequences. So Al Qaeda didn't actually do anything that threatened us as a nation, but it was such a, a deep wound that it provoked this response that 17 years later has cost hundreds of lives, about $6 trillion in damage, the loss of, of, of expense cost, the loss of American credibility and legitimacy around the world. So it's had the state response to the non-state actor has had a huge consequence, and we may look back at this and see, well, this was the turning point. This was like Athens' ill-conceived invasion of Sicily, which led to, the down, what led to the downfall of the Athenian Empire. This may be where the U.S. reached its overextension point, you know, and, and induced such, such a, a cascade of, of, of self-inflicted uh, of, of bad choices that, that it, 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 it impacted the, the trajectory of, of U.S. dominance in the world. So I mean, non-state actors include the Catholic Church, Facebook, <laughs> the entire <laughs> private sector, the, the academic world. So I, I think maybe the question was non-state yeah. armed groups, which you know, we, we yeah. sort of defaulted to. But yeah, um, to me, non-state actors define the world that we live in, again, far more than do the states that we live in. The, Wall Street is composed of non-state actors, and it took down the entire global economy a mere decade ago, which we're still recovering from. I mean, to say that non-state actors are sort of subordinate to states is to me to miss the entire experience of planet Earth. Um, so, you know, um, to me, the, the, you know, the, the intellectual rigor that defines the entire systems that we have come out of academia, come out of the private sector, come out of civil society, come out of political movements, grassroots movements, religious institutions, those are all non-state actors. And, and when the state um, views itself somehow better than or more than the sum of those parts, it's to grossly overestimate its own power and potential. As far as the role of non-state armed groups, um, you know, while they have, they, they're by no means a monolith, right? I mean, they're, they're depending on who you ask, you know, Hamas is, ha is one of the most stabilizing actors in certain parts of the world for, for many people, and they're a terrorist organization, according to most states. Um, you know, so too for for populist militia groups that have you know sought to defend their their you know pieces of territory on the earth from environmental destruction from the extractives industry. So you know, and these are non-state armed groups. So I think again, uh, you know, asking non-state actors v states who should win is is you know is sort of asking the wrong question. Wow. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, the next question that I have for you is, to what degree, if any, one of the growing, are the growing consequences of global climate change relevant to these countries? Science ain't wrong. It's science, it's not opinion. And it's fact-based, and we're all in big trouble. Uh, I, 
I would just add that for 20 years at least, um, one of the predictions for a great war in the Middle East was over water. Well, the people forget that the, the, the Syrian yeah. rebellion began because of a 10-year drought yeah, right. in yeah. Syria, which yeah. is directly attributable to climate change, which is why you had a U.S. military leaders in Congress this week testifying that climate change was a national security threat. Mm -hmm. No matter what the, the president and his advisors were saying, they see it. They understand mm -hmm. the migration issues, the, well, the threat to, to, to ports around the world, uh, the, the food uh, scarcity that this is going to be introduced. The, for people whose business is actually looking at the big picture, the big arc, they get this big time. It's the politicians who haven't been able to um, incorporate it into a sustainable strategy. The next question uh, is, if the U.S. is still the one standing global superpower, China's economic might make it a formidable challenger, and Russia under Putin, if not economically speaking, at least in terms of geopolitical relevance, has basically risen from the dead, what is the European Union doing in the title of this panel on global hegemony? <laughs> Since lately it seems to be plagued by one crisis after another, from the Eurozone financial crisis to Brexit to the fact that it is not even a state. Is Europe old news? Or is its daring experiment in transnational governance the way of the future? Who wrote that? That was great. <laughs> that was a great. I, I think that was our moderator. Oh, that was you? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me just start, because it goes back to the first question. When you start to look at what the alliance models are for the future, you know, we have to look at what's worked so far. I mean, you have two shining models out there. One is NATO, which is the most successful military alliance in history and has helped keep the peace in Europe, which is no small thing for the bloodiest continent in, in human history. And the other is the European Union, which I would argue is the most successful economic and political alliance in, 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 in human history. Now, well, the, the European Union is going through convulsions right now for reasons that will probably be discussed at other panels, but it still is, it, it, it is working very well and should be the model. It should be something we should learn from. And if we don't uh, get to new, we don't, there's an there's a intellectual crisis, I think, in U.S. foreign policy uh, intellectuals and, and discussions because we don't have a new model. Nobody's really s substantially talking about this, but we better act soon because the Chinese are experimenting with new, experimenting with new models. I, mean, I don't know what you call the, the One Belt, One Road plan, but that is way more than just an, an, an infrastructure plan. And they're building an, an alliance model around that, and we have nothing to answer that. We have no sort of global equivalent of what the Chinese are doing. I wouldn't get too alarmed about China hitching up with Kyrgyzstan, um, but, but the, the One Belt, One Road thing is a significant strategic initiative in the world. But the one thing the Chinese do not have is soft power. They just don't understand it. And no matter how much they buy and no matter how much they expand, their ultimate concern in a cosmic sense is that all politics are local. And the agenda that China has going on internally dwarfs its global concerns and how it presents itself to the world. It does not know how to do that. That's why I mentioned this aspirational notion of America. If China ever becomes aspirational, I mean, all the college kids, students, they all want to go there and work now. That's where the jobs are. You know, it's like Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So, it, and this is the same thing. So I, I wouldn't get upset about that, people wanting to go there to work. People do not want to cast off their American roots, passport values, whatever it is, to go move to China. Don't worry about that. But, but I, I, I think China just doesn't get it. China has a tin ear, and it really is to our benefit that it does. Uh, Ambassador? I'd, I'd just add one thought. Um, your, your question about the European Union at one level more or less answers itself. Yeah. Um, 
but the, the weakness and the disillusion that one sees in Europe that's reflected in the comments that have been made here, that's been spurred by Russian, uh, uh, Russian misinformation, disinformation, cyber warfare, and, and maybe efforts from other players as well, weakening Europe is weakening a bulwark of American security and American interests. And, and to that extent, it is a problem and, and, and therefore kind of does belong on this, on this mm -hmm. agenda for somewhat uh, backward reason. Okay, I think that a few of the speakers already touched upon these uh, points, but uh, I see a lot of activity on, on this topic online and also some questions from the audience as well. What can the United States uh, do to respond to China's Belt and Road Initiative and the general trend of Chinese economic colonialism? I think that people might be referring to the growing aid packages to Africa and also well. the growing uh, positive sentiment, speaking of soft power as well, uh, towards the way of China I, in I just have some one of the developing world. One sentence, we should cut our military budget and increase our foreign aid budget. <laughs> Morgan? So our, our foreign aid budget represents less than 1% of, of the U.S. federal budget on the discretionary side. Um, whereas the military accounts for roughly 35% of discretionary spending. So you, we're not even in the same ballpark. And, and when you want to compare it to China, uh, they're both you know, hard power budget and soft power budget dwarf both of you know, bo any ability for our foreign assistance to rival it in any way, shape, or form, simply because the Chinese model have conjoined state power and economic power into state-owned enterprises and we just don't have that structure. So, you know, you, you can, to me, you know, having a, a country that represents, uh, you know, one-third or one-fifth of humanity um, and, and a budget that is on par with its, you know, share of the world population um, is, it would, and trying to go head-to-head -head with it dollar for dollar is, again, sort of misguided. Um, I, I, we, could, we could amplify our foreign assistance budget literally 5,000% and it would not even come close to the One Belt, One Road budget alone. And that's one project, that's one initiative. And, you know, and nor, would, nor is it sort of a binary choice that, that the partners, which, which include, yes, you know, the sort of smaller states, uh, Micronesias of the world, the, the you know, Central Asian states, but also as of you know, this month, uh, Italy. Uh, is now a one, be one belt, one road partner. Uh, states within Australia, uh, which has a federal system just like the United States, and there are subnational jurisdictions that have signed up to the one belt, one road, including the state of Victoria in Australia. And so all of these you know, jurisdictions um, don't have to make a binary choice. They are choosing both. They're saying yes to One Belt, One Road, and yes to NATO, and yes to, uh, you know, yes to Europe, yes to American foreign direct investment. To me, the real sort of answer um, is, is in cross-sectorism, that when I was in government, it, it baffled me that my, my colleague, my, my you know, fellow diplomats would sort of bristle at the prospect of reaching out to the American private sector um, as, you know, to bring them into part and parcel of a, you know, a whole of society strategy. Um, that was sort of, you know, that's not how we do diplomacy. Well, that's how China does diplomacy. That's how China does soft power, and they're darn good at it. Um, to, to say that China doesn't have soft power, I think, is a dangerous statement. Um, and, and I'm not a fear monger, but uh, I mean, China is, is making alliances with sub-Saharan Africa in ways that we don't even begin to understand. It's not just the debt packages. It's not just infrastructure investments. It's not just the communications infrastructure. It's language schools. It's study abroad programs. It's investment in their higher education system. It's all of that, and those are soft power because they are done through the arms and the levers of the Chinese state. And the partners that are happy to sort of to shake the hand of those arms um, are also still wanting to engage us, the U.S., and they don't have to make a choice, and, and I'm not sure that forcing them into a choice um, would be in our interest, sort of to hearken to, to Ambassador Wilson's comment of, you know, we're, we're not good at playing as sort of a, a among peers, among equals, and the reality is to sort of force our friends in Europe or in Australia to say, choose America or China um, would be to, you know, to, to put a, a fracture in systems that we all depend on. Ambassador? Just to illustrate 
uh, with numbers, the point that my, uh, uh, my colleague has made about trying to compete with China on dollar terms, one response that the United States Congress came up with to the essentially the Belt and Road and, and, and China's massive infrastructure spending around the world was to pass something called the BUILD Act mm -hmm. that, that combines several different government agencies that you, most people have probably never heard of uh, and increase their, their lending capacity from about $30 billion a year to $60 billion. $60 billion, that's a big number. What's Belt and Road, a trillion? 60 billion, it, you, you and can't. And it's debt, not equity. And it's debt, not equity. Um, this is, uh, well, it was, it's, it, it was a positive step in a certain sense, but, but relatively small in comparison to the problem. Yeah. Certainly, there's been enough reporting in the press to, to suggest to <clears throat> us that the uh, US government has been engaged over the last year or more uh, with European governments and with governments in the developing world to think twice about getting too far in bed with the Chinese uh, business community. Corrupt, predatory business practices, uh, debt, um, debt financed infrastructure projects that aren't sustainable, that cannot be repaid, that cannot generate enough additional earnings to pay for themselves, that then leave countries kind of at, at China's mercy, so to speak, or certainly uh, exposed, to, uh, exposed to Chinese pressure that they might not have intended. It's somewhat less than a, you know, than a, than a call to arms, uh, but it's, it is absolutely, this, there's a set of things here you should be thinking about consciously, and you should be consciously making those decisions, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure, whether it's pipelines, yeah. uh, technology infrastructure, dams, roads, yeah. things that actually kind of matter for the future, future of our country. I think basically that's the right approach um, getting our own house in order, as others have suggested, is also an important an important part of the picture. Okay. Uh, can I just have one small footnote uh, to, to Morgan's point? You you um, you got the percentage wrong. It's not 35 percent. Military spending is 53 yeah. percent. You yeah. just yeah. flipped it. Yeah. I was just sitting there doing yeah. the math. The, the president's budget is uh, 1 trillion, 1.426 trillion. Military spending would be se seven. Uh, 750 is what he's asking for. So that's. I think so they I, got 564 billion though, and yeah. all of foreign assistance got about 50. Yeah, oh, oh that's <laughs> last, right. So, so half of everything, the discretionary spending, though, so not yes. mandatory, right. everything else, health and human services, infrastructure, NASA, education. The State Department, uh, USAID. Uh, right, yeah. every, everything else is, is, we spend half of all the money we can, we ha we can we're allocating. Uh, on the military, that is out of whack. That is unsustainable. That's that's what you want to worry about global hegemony. We cannot sustain a leadership role in the world with that kind of distorted budget. And, I mean, I, and I would say this is you know I, we're on film. This is hardly Chatham House rules, and, and my biggest clients are the U.S. Army. So you know, forgive me out there who's watching, but <laughs> so is my husband. He's a he's an active duty Army officer. Um, but most senior military leaders who I know, and I spend a lot of time with a lot of generals, will say, um, just like Secretary Mattis did, if you want us yes. to increase the defense budget, then you then you better give it. Or if you want to decrease the foreign assistance budget, you better give us more money to buy more bullets yeah. because there's going to be more conflict. Mm -hmm. um, soft power is what prevents conflict and military might is is a break glass just you know last resort in case of emergency and it's not civilians saying that it's military leaders saying that it's military leaders that are saying in all of the strategy formulation about great power competition it's all of it is in the realm to use military parlance. There's an acronym called DIME, which stands for uh, Diplomacy, Infrastructure, and Information, Military, and Economic. And they're saying, this is not an M problem. This is, this is a diplomatic problem, an economic problem, and an information infrastructure problem. And those are not levers that DOD is designed to have as their core capabilities. So our senior most military strategists and leaders are saying, where's the US foreign assistance budget? Where are the cross-sector partnerships that need to form alliances that are not in the military realm, but are in the soft power, diplomatic, and economic uh, levers of national power? Yeah.
Uh, with eight minutes to go, we have time for just one more question. Uh, it is a question from, a, from an exchange student from Egypt, and it is a very powerful and beautifully sincere question, in my opinion. <laughs> Can all wars end completely at some point? Is there a time or a chance that every country will get what they want without millions of souls dying? Let me just start the discussion. I would say the answer to that is yes. Uh, I would say history is on our side. If you read Steven Pinker, you understand why the, the violence has been decreasing in human history. We are at, actually at a, at a fairly low point of violence in human history, and you just compare where we are now to the first half of the 20th century, which was the blo bloodiest 50 years in human history, where, where, where you know, t tens of millions were killed. We haven't had a war like World War II in over 75 years. So there's, there's a reason for, for that. There's a reason for that. And it's because of policies that people have implemented and structures that people have, have implemented. So I think, yes, overall, you can do that. And if you're Gene Roddenberry, you believe, <laughs> you certainly believe this, that your human history will come to a point where, where war is outlawed. <laughs> war is outlawed. Right, where we actually, where war is outlawed war and we enforce is. it. And we already enforce it, right. But it's, it's not going to be smooth. It's not going to be a, a smooth trajectory. We're going to have to struggle for it. Okay. Ambassador? Um, I, I come at the question in a somewhat different way. It's not a matter of whether uh, uh, the, the goals and objectives that the question refers to, which are obviously all of us sort of share those sentiments. The question is how. As we're practitioners. Several of us yeah. here have been in the game trying to affect policies to move in the right directions. And I think it, it so our, our, our bias, and certainly my bias, is what are going to be the policies that will make the better outcomes more likely and will make bad outcomes less likely. That's American engagement. That's American partners in the world. That's America getting its domestic house in order. That's a strong, uh, that's a strong economy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's also a country that figures out ways to deal effectively with those countries we don't agree with. Because there's a bunch of them and we, we're not going to change them. We, we've tried that and it didn't work out real well. We have to find ways to work with our adversaries just as much uh, as, as, uh, as effectively as with others. It, it would be a great shame if the carnage of the last century were repeated by the same actors and that's what makes me so fearful about the breakup of the EU. I'm absolutely terrified that they will be the cause of it. And I, I, God help me, I hope I'm wrong. I, Can we end on a more hopeful note? I was going to say, maybe? on a hopeful note, there. <laughs> Did you we, hear the one I, about I, the traveling salesman? No. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, on a really hopeful note, as 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 a practitioner of literally trying to prevent and an end war and mitigate the the consequences of conflict, I am inspired by the fact that there is one war that's attempting to be ended as we speak, and that's the war in Afghanistan yes. and the peace process that's ongoing. Um, and and I, you know, am so happy to finally see uh, the U.S. government government at the table, even though under less than ideal circumstances, um, to really having constructive conversations, um, albeit they uncomfortable, with uh, a belligerent that we are, have been in a stalemate with and sort of on a fool's errand uh, competing with for, for almost two decades. Um, so that, that war very, very realistically could end, um, you know, this year or next year. And then another war, uh, you know, air quotes war, small war, um, is uh, the FARC in Colombia. And I am not an, an America's no. person, but the fact that the FARC was um, this entrenched belligerent that, um, that in many ways terrorized a, a country and, and at, at, one, at points over the last seven decades posed an existential threat to, to Colombia uh, has just reconciled uh, with the Colombian government and the Colombian people, albeit a rocky road. But um, you know the, the referendum that was initially put out by President Santos in 2016 that was rejected uh, by the people of Colombia that said, no, we will not uh, make peace with the FARC, um, was then sort of hurriedly used as a lever to get the FARC to um, sort of, uh, you know, 
come even further towards peace, and it worked. And, and now the FARC, um, you know, while imperfect, is no longer uh, terrorizing you know, the, the hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of Colombians who experienced the war under their thumb for seven decades. So wars do end. They're very difficult to end. Paul Collier's um, a diagram that really maps out the conflict cycle that shows that um, the likelihood of civil wars repeating themselves is about, a, there's about a 90% um, perpetuation rate, recidivism rate, if you will, of conflicts, that 90% of current civil wars in the, in the world uh, active today are repeat civil wars from the last only three decades. Um, so it's very difficult to end wars, but it can be done, and, it, and, it, uh, and there are great examples that are unfolding right now in our era of, of when it works. That is the hopeful note that we needed. <laughs> Thank you for the speakers and thank you for the audience. This has been a great panel. You did a great job moderating. Really? Yeah. Well, I'll see you later.